Der Fefe hatte mich gebeten, mich kurz zu halten, weil ähm, er hat mir Angst, dass der Talk nicht in die 30 Minuten passt. Fefe hat mich to keep it short, because he's worried about it fitting in the 30 minutes that's allocated. So I'm going to pass it over, introduce you to anti-patterns and misunderstanding in software development. Just like you said, Fefe, that's the guy who used to have a column in the former news magazine. Here we go. Which is Der Spiegel. <laughs> Hey guys, howdy. Thanks for showing up in such numbers. It's numbers I didn't expect. Okay, we're talking about anti-patterns. It's a thing that you do, you do a lot, that cause problems to solve problems uh, that don't solve the problem or cause more problems. And so I thought, at this Congress, there's lots of so here's a motto that I find very profound and that you'll you'll see a lot why this is the motto as the talk proceeds if you can if you can read uh, the man who does not read has no advantage over the man who cannot the structure of this talk I'd like to uh, demonstrate um, the structure. We're going to start with a problem, and then we're going to say SEAL Team uh, 6 is on the job. And so think of a team of special experts. Um, I'm sure they're all nice people. And then it comes into the implementation. That's usually when things go wrong. And then we have an effect, and hopefully, uh, we have uh, re become realization. So problem became problem factory. That's an, an allusion to Java. And so we also have an inter interactive component inspired by British Parliament. If you've noticed that people murmur when they sort of agree. And so instead of raising your hand, which could make you afraid and, and sort of uh, out yourself. So if you recognize one of these patterns, please go ahead and murmur along like in the British Parliament. That is, so our first problem, this picture, I'd like to say, so it looks like we have a, was donated to me, it's a bunch of, looks like releases and zip files on a USB drive. I'm not trying to blame any of my, uh, any of my uh, customers. So it's a typical problem in, in, problem in software development is versioning and backups maintaining backups of older version. I guess, hope you can see this is a USB stick. And so the idea that you have is a versioning system, and that's a good, a good idea. And in practice, SEAL Team 6 is on the job again. And so the effect is Git. And you know, Git is good. And there's not just Git, there's SVN, Bitbucket Perforce for GitHub accounts. And that's when things just start to go wrong. I had a customer. Uh, who, who used Git and told his... And then he asked, which Git? And so the effect of this is that everyone checks everything and everywhere. And I'm sorry, we took them. Oh, okay. So just versioning isn't enough because uh, somebody um, had permissions and just changed the things back that were changed in the versioning system. And it, another thing you get is people checking in um, binaries. And I'm not talking about images or, or, or screenshots or something, but binaries and executables, which is something you're not supposed to do. There are very few exceptions, and if you if you have one of those exceptions, you'll know it, and otherwise don't do it. And I mean, this is of course an extreme example, but I've seen similar things, and um, I, I've seen people check in different versions and uh, not understanding what the point of a versioning system is. The image here was um, different zip files checked into the versioning system. And I always have a, a tip, and um, my tips is, well, um, Git is quite okay. Um, I'm aware of the irony that my own software is on the internet as a CVS, um, but that's got historic reasons. 
um, keep your patches small so you can um, deal with them uh, separately. Um, that's a huge problem if somebody has a huge multi-megabyte patch. Um, do a do a separate branch if you have to um, pre pre prepare some work to be able to apply the patch. Um, if you have assumptions about versions and features that are uh, that that have to be fulfilled, you have to check that in a build script and don't just start building then abort after two hours. Check in the beginning, abort as fast as you can. Fail fast. And um, in companies, there's often the idea that um, every different department has their own um, repository and uh, separate versioning system. And that can work, but it does work very rarely. And um, that only works when you have stable I a APIs. And of course, everybody believes that their APIs are stable, but it's not. So don't do it if you can avoid it. All right, next problem. And um, that one is we always lose the bugs. And uh, so the solution is a bug tracker. And the implementation is, of course, SEAL Team 6 just quickly hacking something together. And the effect you get is bugs, bugs everywhere. And of course, that's the problem. We've got a lot of bugs. What do we do now? Um, and a thing that I now see as an anti-pattern is priority, something like severity blocker or a security tag. Um, and the effect of that is, of course, that everything else is left open. And you can see that again and again. Um, what I uh, see, what kills um, most bugs, or the, most, the highest amount of bugs, is when you remove a feature. And other than deleting such a feature, you don't get rid of these bugs. There's a nice word for that. Um, thank you for apologizing. Right, and he calls it a bugwelle, which is the bow, um, the bow wave. Um, when a ship pushes a bow wave ahead of itself, this is a pun in German. Okay, so we have the problem, we have so many uh, bugs. And the idea is we reward bug-free code. Right, sounds good. Ideally with a bonus in money, you get a reward. And then, you know, that leads to you asshole opened bugs. I got a mail once where I recorded bugs and I got a mail from someone saying, you ass, now I can't pay my, my mortgage. Um, uh, and I didn't know how to respond. He closed all the bugs and called it not a bug. Um, it was his solution. Which he promised me that he f would fix all of them, but you can imagine how well that worked. So, um, reward and incentive stuff, it, don't do it with money. It's tricky. But there is also an anti-anti-pattern to that. Uh, and that was fixing all the bugs in the code and not closing them in the bug tracker. And his response, his reason for doing so was, well, if I close them, um, then they don't need me anymore. Um, and he saw all his colleagues being sent out, uh, jobs being outsourced to India, so he just left the um, bugs open, and that kind of took my breath away, and um, I, I slept badly for a couple of days, because what kind of self-image has he got of himself uh, if, if that um, bug tracker affects him so much? And it, it happens more often than you think. Um, that people um, leave the box open because if, if they close them, then uh, the, the boss comes with the next to-dos and if they leave the box open, they have um, a week of breathing room. That's, that's a common pattern. So here's another classic problem. You have an awesome project and our code only works on the, on the computer of the developer. And so your solution is make a build server. And so now we got a build server. It's going to build stuff. It's going to be awesome. SEAL Team 6 is on the job. And it looks awesome. Look, he's got a drone assisted building here. And so the, the, pro, the problem is that the build server is built by a team and can only build the code of that team. Um, and so the rest of the code is br brought in as old artifacts, uh, libraries as a blob from some network store, and of course that sucks. That happens. 
Um, and of course, builds are manually triggered. It, you, you have a build server and someone has to manually go there and click to start it. When it, if I tried to pull out a build, <laughs> And so the idea of a build server is it does it automatically. And so if your build has failed, then the, the dev just logs in and fixes something, edits a file on the server, and fixes it. And, it, it, and in the growth of, of DevOps is something we're going to see more and more. It, it completely destroys the advantage of the build server. And of course, we have that same effect of only working on the, the machine of the developer, but not the one on his desk, but the one in on the rack, the build server. And I hope the next, I hope that Debian takes up this naming convention. Debian Ramsey's the first with GCC. You see something like this, this really complicated um, setup, um, and that holds back the whole project because certain software versions that are totally normal things that doesn't have that can do modern normal things like TLS 1.2. Or like a really old C++ version, and so you can't use the new features, and so that sucks. And so you know the illustration of this is this big pile of garbage. Um, and so the idea of build servers is that you can do daily builds without having to go there and, and click things off, and oh, and without being able to go and fix things. And that they're de deterministic and reproducible builds, and that you're that you're more agile, so you can you can ask for things like build the version from yesterday at five, and so you can you can tell when codes being uh, code being checked in breaks the build. You, and you don't want these crazy scenarios. Und es wäre mir sehr lieb, dass so Open Source Entwickler auch alle dafür sorgen, dass ihre Projekte mit beliebiger Parallelität baubar sind. You want these um, build servers to also work in parallel without having race conditions where um, you can end up with having the wrong version because the other part of the build wasn't quite done. And if um, the build breaks, then I, I can just say I, I can do one click and roll back to the previous version, which still worked. And if you can't do that, then the build server is kind of useless either. And so the point is that ultimately you find really um, quickly who uh, checked in or what checked in um, something that broke the build. But of course the idea is um, uh, not to punish that because because um, I've, I've seen a, a, a company where they had Britney Spears t-shirt and whoever broke the build had to wear that and that worked well until they find, found somebody who was a Britney Spears fan. All right, so problem. The build only works on the, um, uh, on the developer's machine and of course today you solve that with Docker but of course that's not in principle a bad idea but of course Seal Team 6 just hacks something together and it pulls some images from somewhere on the internet and uh, the classics is of course um, Debian Rams is the second and MySQL something from 19 whatever. Docker is not made for this. It's made for being able to change this in an agile fashion and if you don't do that then you end up with having a, a Frankenstein garbage project. I see that a lot where in the industry where people take all the disadvantages but leave the advantages behind. And a uh, common effect is that you have components in sort of statics versions that have been manually chosen when the build was um, set up, but they weren't um, updated ever. And I've seen people with build servers who build everything um, automatically and, you know, you can see when things were built, but and everything happens automatically, but they use versions from 2004 and that happens a lot. And if you notice in your company that Components are being used in old versions. Tell your build people. Otherwise, you end up with these uh, walking aid for old people. Um, you have containers for autom automated deployment in a deterministic um, state. And not everybody understands it, but it's also important to have a trivial rollback. If something breaks, then you, then you just build the old version. And 
um, that's not a that's not a side effect. That's one of the features. That's one of the core elements of why you would use this uh, container-based system. And I can just regenerate a new build. Um, and that's why I also told you to check the um, dependencies in the build so you can do it quickly and you notice when you do something, when something breaks. And um, containers also allow you to update components um, quickly and agilely. And it's not black magic, it's important. And I'm always surprised by how few people actually do that. And the last and quite important aspect is that you can isolate components separately, um, isolate pro components from each other. And these containers are separate. So if some, if one of these get hacked, is hacked, then not all of them are compromised. But in practice, you can see that there is the monster container which contains all of them, all of the components at once. And so it's really good in combination um, where Git has all the versions, the build server can, has access to the state, uh, the, the most current state, um, and then a container image falls out without any dependencies. Um, the next problem is our code doesn't work, and so you probably heard of that before too. It's a problem, so what do we do? Unit test, that's our solution. And so in practice, what do we do? Uh, when we fix a bug, then we'll make a unit test from it. And so to check if it's if it's uh, fixed, we make a unit test, yeah. And that's not good. And that way you get 2.3% test coverage. And I don't know if you know this video before. This was a machine for a soap disp dispenser, and it, it, it was made by white people. And so if someone with a different skin color uh, went up to it, then they couldn't get any soap. And so that's a, a classic case of unit tests. Uh, unit tests are there to check if the code is correct. Unit Oh, sure, they're not there to check if the code is correct. They're there to check if the code is still correct. That is, if... So it, when you make a chain, change, you can tell if stuff still works. So you're not afraid to touch old code. That's what you need to take, take off your shoulders. Uh, because you don't understand that old code, and so the more coverage you have, the more confidence you can have um, uh, when you uh, are editing old code. And so, applause from the audience. Only positive tests. You have to run through this because I have so many slides, so I hope you'll forgive me. And the next problem is that people only have positive tests. Um, so how does that work? It basically is as good as having no text tests because the most bugs are in error handling. And that's what you need unit tests for. Uh, and so for everything that can have an error, you need, an, uh, you need a test for it um, that tests what happens if this fails. Um, and so that's the, kind of that's the kind of stuff that causes another error somewhere. And so you have some memory corruption error or something like that. And then I have a remote memory leak and the process classes and this kind of stuff is totally, uh, can totally uh, covered by y unit tests. It's, they're, not, they're, they're not a universal uh, magic bullet. Um, and even if you have 100% coverage, you, can, you could have missed some cases. And so, and so there, there are tools for testing your coverage. Use them, even if it's not perfect. Uh, the next case is our developer has missed some cases, missed testing certain cases. And so the idea is, oh, do your, do your tests first, and then write the code, test-driven development. And I, I have no idea. I've never seen that in practice, so I literally have no idea. I only know people. The audience applauds, uh, applauds at this. I, I only know people who are sure that this is the greatest thing ever. Um, and if you've actually seen this work in practice, please send me an email because I'd like to see it. The next problem is, no, we have some code, but nobody has any idea how that works. And the solution is, of course, documentation. It's a good idea. I'm not going to say whatever, but, you know, Sil Time 6 sets up a wiki. That's our solution here. They're on the job. And so then the effect is wiki's down right now. It's throwing exceptions. The SSL certificate has expired. Isn't valid anymore or something. That happens all the time. And so you get these sentences like, uh, I think I put that in the wiki somewhere. Uh, you, you need to bookmark this. Uh, we don't have a navigation yet. 
and then, oh my God, all the time, that part up there isn't true anymore. So wikis is, is not a solution. The, the, the smaller the smaller of a an effort you have have to do to make a change, the less um, the less people actually end up contributing to this project or whatever. So the next idea that you see in big companies a lot of times is communication, need more communication, people to talk to each other. And so open office is a solution, maybe with cubicles. And this is what it looks like. It's an image of a crowded platform at a train station. I have never seen this work either. Doesn't work. People have to be able to concentrate all at once, or sort of in one piece. And People need to be able to focus for a certain span of time, and in an open plan office that doesn't work. And... Um, Right now, the trend is going to installing Slack and, and interrupting each other intentionally. And I don't get that at all, because after every interruption, you need like a 15-minute um, time slot to get back into it. And all of these chat programs and mail programs need to... Uh, they're, they're, they're designed to not give you that time. Meetings. I don't think I need to say a lot about that. But the effect is always the same. I can't focus. Um, and that's a serious problem. And you have to actively work against that. And I, I thought about uh, advising to keeping it short. Um, but I've never seen that work. And so just keep it rare and keep it one-on-one. -on -one. If, if there's something and you have to deal with it, um, it, if you have the whole team together, it, it's a higher barrier for somebody to say, well, I fucked up. Um, so keep it one-on-one. -on -one. Nobody wants to um, admit shameful things in front of their colleagues, but in a one-on-one, -on -one you can deal with it. Okay, so we've got a problem. We've got code, but we don't trust what it does. First idea, we remove the compiler warnings. Good idea. But the, the, the effect, and there I was shocked there is already a term for it, is onion code. And that means I have this huge chunk of legacy code with tons of warnings and nobody has looked at it in five years and somebody finds a bug um, and then somebody fixes that. And uh, But it still has all of these warnings and I, I can't check in the bug because I uh, would need to fix all of the warnings, but I don't understand the code, so I can't do that. So I add a little layer that just um, intercepts this bug and fixes this bug um, without touching the actual code. And when multiple people do that, you get these layers, you get an onion, and if you see that, burn it with fire. It's horrible. All right, so next idea. We release only without open bugs, and um, I had a customer who tried to do that, and uh, then that leads to mails like, just close all of your bugs. And then my response was, well, I, I'm here to open bugs, not close them. And then they said, yeah, 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 we'll reopen them afterwards, at which the audience laughs. I don't really have to elaborate whether they were opened or not. All right, so... Uh, this hurts my soul because that's what I'm kind of doing, external audits. Because what happens is that you get this sort of black box pen test, and that means the tester has no full access to the system. He doesn't know how it works. He should figure it out in the test, and then that's what you get. Um, he shows a meme saying, says he'll pen test your network, uh, screws around for four days, submits Qualys report. And that image existed before. Um, because what happens is that you don't test the code, you test the pen tester. And I as pen tester could say, oh, well, fuck it, uh, I get paid. But I really have a higher moral standard. I would really like to help the customer. If, if you do this kind of messing around and not doing it, then don't do it. It hurts everyone. Um, and part of that is that... that um, often these tests only happen due to compliance um, and it's already terrible that we need 
that we screwed up security so much that we need compliance for people to still do security. So the idea is fuzzing. This is just giving random in inputs until it um, explodes. And um, I've experienced that people said, well, you don't have to test this code. We, we've been running fuzzers for months against this. Um, you don't have to check it. Unfortunately, they tested two billion times the same case. Great. So, of course, so fuzzing is often a fig leaf um, that prevents other things from happening because we've done fuzzing, right? What else do we need to do? I've got nothing against fuzzing. It's a great tool, but it, it's not, it, you, you mustn't neg ne neglect other measures because you've done fuzzing. Or use it as an excuse. And this is a general problem I've seen. Which measures should we take? Um, should I take the measure that probably works but doesn't give me metrics um, to quantify what I've done? Or the thing that doesn't do a lot but that I can quantify very well? Management really loves being able to quantify things. And that leads to, well, that was really shocking for me. I'm... I'm I have a good price um, value ratio, but I'm not cheap. And I get to this um, customer and he tells me to go home. I was like, why? Yeah, it's too, too warm today. Um, you'll get paid anyway. And the answer was, well, the... Uh, the the AC is only for one is only enough for one thing the fuzzing lab or the consultants and well okay and the last problem is sort of tricky but it's very important to me and it's kind of coming and getting bigger our coders are in over their heads and um, we need a solid um, uh, ansatz here um, which is threat modeling and every team has to do sort of threat models for the code and that's good and that is good but the uh, ultimately it leads to the project manager or the feature owner to just filling out some forms and the developers aren't affected at all and that's a big mistake because threat modeling isn't about the paper that comes out at the end. It's not about the, the certificate. It's about the road to that paper. It's about the developers looking at their code from the perspective of the attacker and um, making and, and, and thinking in that mode of thought. And, and if somebody else does the threat model, you can forget about it. You could have saved that. Threat model is good but the developers have to do it. We're almost done here. I've got some more general um, tips and I, because I can't let you go home in such a depressed state. From the point of the manager, it's really important to have this culture of errors where nobody is um, punished for bugs, but people who find bugs are rewarded. You have to reward people. Audience claps. You have to reward people when they find and fix a bug. Not with bug, not with money, but with glory. And I propose, you know, Fridays in the uh, just before you stop, all hands meeting. Of course, if you have got something important to do, you don't need to come. No, no, forcing no one. But just a meeting where the old hands get to talk about their most awesome bugs to to promote this idea that bugs are a good thing that it's interesting that fixing bugs are, are good and to get rid of this sort of rock star status because that also doesn't really do um, and another thing is to have the people who did the bug fix the bugs um, in big companies it's often that you have a security team that fixes the security bugs and then the the dev who is responsible for writing all this bad code never realizes that he writes bad code and he moves around and he he leaves bombs behind everywhere and that's not to punish them but it's for them to be able to grow and get better they need the feedback to know when they made mistakes and again in the meeting it's not about saying in front of the whole team you fucked up it's about it's also a cultural thing different cultures can handle this better but a lot of people have a big problem with being told that they screwed up. In Japan, it's terribly important to help the company and not be seen owing someone someone. And it's tricky to build this culture, but it's very important. Mistakes aren't bad. 
you can learn from mistakes, mistakes are good. And the company has to communicate values. Um, like, it's more important to have good code than to have more features. Um, it's important that when we wrote something, we get back to that and we improve it, and when we learn something, we go back to old code and improve it. And to do that stress -really, uh, stresslessly, we need lots of unit tests. There's a circle closing here. And then the other thing is that an anecdote, um, a friend had a job and there was a user phase and we both had no idea. And then um, he, we, let's let's do it in, in, in QT. And I was like, we, we don't have no idea of Q2. And he said, well, I want to learn about it. And it's been a few years, but if people aren't given time to learn things by the company, then they will learn these things in projects, which will then be screwed up. Okay, and what you you do see sometimes too is that management th thinks that they want to be the ar they want to prescribe the architecture of the software of what ar what database should be used, and that's almost always a bad idea, because either the architecture is obvious, in which case it doesn't help, or if it's not obvious, in which case it doesn't help because they misunderstood the problem. So that's the kind of thing that you should um, you know sort of stand up to management on. And so, a little more self-help for, for developers here, it's the last slide. Um, make the pressure come from yourself. Management talks a lot, deadlines here and there, but, but don't, um, don't let that make you do overtime. Um, don't take any realistic, uh, expect unrealistic expectations. You want to you get home at five. If they're, if they're making unrealistic expectations, you have to be very honest. This is probably not going to happen. I'll take the money, I'll work on it, but I'm going to tell you now, it's not going to work. You know, and, and leave, a, leave a nice little, little paper, paper trail that it's not going to work out. And, uh, you know, you can work on it because you need the money. A lot of you will. But be honest um, about, about expectations. Be open about expectations. Expectations. It's a big problem in, in this in this industry. You have to think of, of management as as um, as you and management training each other, because as soon as uh, as soon as you uh, you do these this uh, overtime, uh, that's the new normal, and they they believe that that can always happen. And so the last sentence I have for time, you have to take time for yourself. <laughs> Raus mit dir! Get out of here! He is uh, overdrawing, and that's why everybody is laughing at this last sentence. The sort of irony here, yeah. So I was just recommending that the management give you time, but you know, if, if you wait for that, it, that's never going to happen. Uh, so I, I worry that the time for Q and A is over now. Yes, it is," said the stage manager. Um, that beeindruckende is ja wirklich so the impressive thing really is they all stayed here and nobody fell off the chair. Yeah. Vielen, vielen Dank. Thanks a lot. Both of the exits are op open. That's it. That's it from Feifei and that's it from us here in the translation booth. Thank you for listening to the translation of Anti-Patterns and Misunderstandings.